So sorry everybody I couldn't make it to Hong Kong. There was uh, some incredible weather at San Francisco, so uh, you'll just have to deal with the, uh, the unjet-lagged version from uh, the University of Oregon. Uh, so the title of my talk is uh, Fractal Expressionism, and uh, I'll be talking about some work that's been published in various places, and I'll show this slide at the end in case any of you uh, want to jot down the publication details. Uh, so it has been a huge interdisciplinary endeavor. I'm a physicist and I've had to work with uh, psychologists, human physiologists and artists. And uh, in terms of today's talk, I'd really like to thank uh, Branka, who's giving a talk at this conference, Caroline Hagelhal, who is an environmental psychologist, and Paul Van Donkela from Human Physiology. Uh, so the star of the story is Jackson Pollock. He was born in 1912, died in 1956, and towards the end of his career he developed this uh, quite amazing technique where he'd roll out his canvases along the floor of his studio and then pour paint directly onto those canvases, building these huge abstract works. And I'll just show you a few examples of them. This one's from 1947, uh, this one's from 1949, from 1950, and from 1952. Uh, now there's been millions of words uh, talked about Jackson Pollock through the years and one of the recurring themes is that people keep on referring to his work as being natural looking and organic looking and certainly when you put one of Pollock's images next to one of nature's images there do seem to be some sort of shared characteristics there. So the big question is what are those shared characteristics? And if we consider many natural scenes, an obvious visual characteristic that hits you is just their immense complexity. So the interesting question is, what is building that complexity? And that is best explained using a snowflake, that if you take an image of a snowflake, take a small part of it and enlarge it, then that image looks exactly the same as the original. And you can keep on going, so you can keep on zooming in at finer and finer scales and you keep on getting the same pattern out. And I know that many of you will be familiar with what that is. That recurrence of patterns at different size scales, of course, is uh, referred to as being fractal. Now, with uh, mathematical fractals, they are referred to as being exact fractals because you get an exact repetition at different magnifications. Nature's fractals are referred to as statistical fractals because as you zoom in at different size scales, the statistical qualities repeat, and uh, with the consequence that that makes them look similar at different size scales. So in 1999, we took a computer analysis usually applied to nature's fractals and applied it to Pollock's work and showed that his patterns are indeed consistent with being uh, with being fractal, and we labeled that fractal expressionism to distinguish it from computer-generated art. Now, uh, since then, that basic study has inspired over 20 groups, including ours, to apply uh, many different fractal analysis techniques to Pollock's work, and I want to tell you about one of the more simple and one of the more robust techniques of fractal analysis called the box counting technique. And what you do is you take uh, an image of Pollock's work and you overlay a mesh of identical squares or what are called boxes and then you can tell the computer to identify which of those boxes contain part of a pattern and which are empty and from that you can actually get the computer to calculate statistical qualities and you can repeat that for finer uh, boxes in the mesh and that is equivalent to zooming in at finer magnifications. So you can assess the statistics at different size scales in this way. One of the common statistics is space coverage. How much space does the pattern occupy? And you can do that quite simply by just counting the number of occupied boxes. In, num in other words, the ones that I've shaded blue in this slide. And we label the number of occupied boxes as N. And we repeat that count for finer and finer box uh, sizes, and the box uh, size is labeled as L. So for a fractal pattern, uh, the relationship between N and L follows a power law, and the exponent D is referred to as the fractal dimension. So we're in an analysis, what we do is plot a scaling plot, as shown here, where you plot 
uh, log of 1 over L, where L is the box size, against log over N, where N is the number of occupied boxes. Um, because of the power law relationship, that data will all sit on a straight line, and the gradient is the D value. Now, the reason why uh, mathematicians are interested in fractals is because that, di that fractal dimension is actually a dimension. And for a fractal pattern, it lies between 1 and 2. And the reason for this is that although Pollock's uh, trajectories are sort of one-dimensional lines, they've got so much repeating structure on them that they begin to actually occupy area. So they have this intermediate dimension line between 1 and 2. Now, the reason why uh, psychologists should be interested in the d-value is that the fractal dimension has a profound impact on the visual look of the fractals, in particular their complexity. So if we consider scaling plots where we have uh, fractals with two different d values, a low d and a high d, if you look at that scaling plot, what we're doing as we move along the x-axis, we're actually zooming in on the pattern. And so the gradient is representing the rate at which we pour in patterns into that fractal mix as we zoom in. A higher gradient means that you're, you're pouring in these patterns at a much larger rate, with the consequence that by the time you get to the fine scale, a high D fractal will have way more fine structure going into that fractal mix than a low D pattern. And you can see that uh, with these computer-generated fractals. High D fractals have way more fine structure in them than low D fractals, with a consequence that they look visually complex. And this is important in terms of Pollock's work. Um, this is plotting uh, the D value of the painting versus the year in which they were painted. So you can see that in the early 40s, he was uh, painting very low D uh, fractals. Then they evolved into these mid-range fractals. And then he painted one fractal in 1952, which had a D value of 1.89. Uh, but he immediately destroyed that painting and scaled back to 1.6, 1.7 again. So we think that his whole process, his whole artistic process, was aimed at generating these mid-range fractals between 1.6 and 1.7. So an interesting question then is why was he doing that? And presumably it's something to do with the, the way that the paintings look and the way that the observer responds to them. So recently we've been doing experiments where we've been assessing the way that people look at Pollock's paintings. And we do that using an eye tracking uh, facility where you flash an image of one of Pollock's fractal paintings on the screen. And then a little infrared camera below actually monitors where your eye has been looking. So here's an example. The black and white images of uh, a fractal pattern that appeared on the screen. And then the red trajectory is where the eye has been looking. And if you apply the box counting technique to that red trajectory, it turns out to be fractal as well. Now the interesting thing is the D value of that trajectory, because you can flash up different fractal images on the screen with different D values and they can look very different. But the fractal dimension of the I trajectory remains anchored at 1.5, irrespective of the D value of the pattern that you're looking at. So an interesting question is, why would the I have a fractal trajectory of 1.5? And we recently explained this in a publication where we actually showed that a fractal trajectory with a D value of 1.5 is incredibly efficient at covering space. And that's exactly what the eye wants to do when it goes into search mode. So we, our hypothesis then is that the eye, when it goes into search mode, has this intrinsic way of dealing with it. It traces out the motion of the eye in a fractal trajectory with D of 1.5. So if it's got this inherent uh, mechanism in the eye of 1.5. The question is what happens when you show somebody a fractal painting of 1.5? Is there some sort of resonance that occurs to do with this commensurability? In particular, is there an increase in the aesthetic value as a result of this? 
And we've been looking at the aesthetics of fractal patterns for over 10 years now. And we tend to use what's called the, the force choice technique, where you flash a pair of images up on the screen, in this case, uh, fractals with different D values, and the person gets to choose which one uh, they write highest in terms of the aesthetics. Um, in our initial studies, we used uh, Pollock paintings as visual stimuli. We also used photographs of natural scenes and also used computer generated uh, art, um, uh, images. Uh, more recently, we've just gravitated towards computer generated images simply because we can control the different parameters. In particular, we can separate out density from fractal dimension. Um, and the results seem quite robust. Um, there seems to be this special range of D values, 1.3 to 1.5, which people rate as being aesthetically high. And like I say, this is quite robust, that it doesn't matter what sort of fractal you actually show the person, this magic range of 1.3 to 1.5 is always rated highly. Now this is obviously a behavioral response. An interesting question is, does it go deeper than that? Do you actually get a physiological response associated with that? In particular, does it actually reduce your stress levels and cause you to actually be more relaxed? So one of the measures of stress that we've used is measuring people's skin conductance. So when you're in a high stress state, you, you have high skin conductance. When you relax, you have low skin conductance. So we would put the participants through a set of tasks, a set of mental arithmetic tasks, where the mental arithmetic would stress the person out. And then uh, intermediately, we'd have uh, points of recovery. So this generates a, a sawtooth pattern in the participant's con uh, skin conductance, that it has high, skin, uh, high conductance when stressed out, low uh, conductance when in a relaxed state. And what we found is if we do this task sequence, uh, but show the person a fractal pattern between 1.3 and 1.5 in the background, that reduces that sawtooth by up to 60%. So it's reducing your physiological response to stress by up to 60%, which is quite a large amount. More recently, uh, we've moved on to EEG to look at the state of relaxation. Uh, in particular, alpha waves between 9 and 12 hertz are well-known signatures of being weightfully relaxed. And again, these mid-range fractal patterns cause a peak in the alpha waves. And uh, not surprisingly, you won't be surprised to find that uh, recently we've moved on to fMRI studies to actually see if there's a difference in uh, regions of the brain that get activated based on the D value. Um, but to summarize then, uh, there does appear to be a, a unique response in people for fractal patterns between 1.3 and 1.5. And intriguingly for me, uh, you'll notice that that's slightly different than what Pollock uh, painted. He gravitated towards uh, 1.6 to 1.7. So uh, Pollock was obviously a great artist and famous throughout the art world in the 20th century. I have a sneaking suspicion that he'd become even more famous in the, the world of psychology in the 21st century because I think that he really is telling us something special about the way that humans uh, respond to nature's patterns in a very positive way. Uh, so as uh, promised, uh, here's the slide with the uh, various publication details in there. Uh, and then again, I apologize that I couldn't make it to Hong Kong. I, I would have done if I could have done. Um, and I just hope that Branka uh, who's my great colleague and friend uh, could actually uh, maybe respond to some of the questions because she's been one of the central characters uh, in this great story. Uh, so I hope you're having a great time in Hong Kong and uh, I hope that I get to see you at another conference in the future. So thank you very much uh, for listening and have a great conference. Thank you. Bye. All right, well timed. I think I just about wrapped that up. Let's